false. <laughs> um, because there, you know, there aren't really uh, any secrets, right, in terms of like, here's how to do it to guarantee that it'll work for you. Uh, but there is kind of a lot of trickery. And um, it's a process that uh, is set up not really to benefit you. You know, it's a process that's set up to benefit uh, the people that need to make the decisions about who to admit. Those are the admissions counselors. They try as hard as they can to sort of find that middle ground between, you know, being able to benefit them and being able to benefit you. But um, what we get is a process that is as varied as anything can be, right? Most other countries, almost every other country does not do it this way. They have a much more simplistic way of doing it. A lot of countries, it's like, whatever you get on your exams, whatever scores you get on your exams, that dictates your path. That says, here's where you're gonna go, you know? So the SAT is not really, um, you know, the same thing. In, the United Kingdom, they've got A levels and O levels. In China, they have the Gaokao. Uh, you know, in other countries, they have these kinds of examinations that are really, really high stakes, and they figure out exactly where you're going to go. Um, they don't do this warm, fuzzy stuff like extracurricular activities and reading your essays and stuff. They don't. They don't mess around with that. Here, we create this opportunity for you to be defined by things beyond just the numbers, right? Beyond the exam scores, beyond the, uh, the GPA and stuff. But what that does is it creates uh, a pretty fuzzy process, right? It's difficult to say, if I have these characteristics, then I will be admitted to X, Y, and Z kind of school. Um, but it also doesn't necessarily rule you out, right? Um, there's a lot of complexity to it. Uh, but at the end of the day, they want to be able to give you the opportunity to kind of define yourself beyond the scope of just numbers. Uh, and so uh, one of the other things that's very different about the United States is that there's versus other countries, there's way more colleges. Uh, like way more, something like 4,000. Uh, and so this is also a very daunting part for a lot of students is like, how do I make that number go from like 4,000 to like a dozen? in terms of the schools that I'm interested in applying to. So I'm going to help you um, think through some of that stuff. So first, let me share my screen. We'll talk about it. I'll do a little more uh, introducing of, of who I am. OK, so I thought that just right off the bat, I would come up with a real compelling title that would just, just grab you, just bring you in. The ins and outs of applying to four-year colleges in the United States. But I want to make it clear, I'm talking, there are other colleges in other countries. And there are other colleges in this country that are two years. So this process is specifically meant to, uh, my presentation is specifically geared to applying to four-year colleges in the United States, because here, the way that we do it is very different, okay? There's my email, it's my first and last name at Gmail if you guys have questions. Um, so, uh, who am I? So first, my own college journey started, uh, I'm from Portland, Oregon, uh, and it was really rainy there, and I was really tired of all of the rain and the gray and the like 45 degree weather, so I went to college in Southern California, because that sounded like a good change. That sounded like the kind of thing I was into. I was thrown to USC. I double majored in film studies and Spanish. Um, my stupid joke about that is, while I, I do not make films for a living, my wife is Puerto Rican, so the Spanish really came in handy, okay? Uh, and then I went to graduate school at NYU. I got a master's degree in public administration. Uh, and then kind of between USC, before NYU and a little bit after NYU, I, I worked at the University of Rochester, uh, the only school I know that doesn't actually put its name on its <laughs> mascot. Meliora is its motto. It stands with some sort of uh, Latin phrase that, that roughly translates to ever better. So I worked in admissions at the University of Rochester for about 10 years altogether. Uh, over that time, I started to get just really, really interested in this field. And so I started a podcast. So if you wanna, if you just love the sound of this voice <laughs> and you want more 
uh, you can find this podcast anywhere. And we talk about college stuff, um, interviews with a lot of really interesting people. I currently work as a school counselor at a private school in Manhattan called Avenues. Um, but I'm also, as I mentioned, uh, working with David on uh, the Pittsburgh stuff, uh, the University of Pittsburgh grant to, to help improve access for students to, to, to get into uh, STEM majors and ultimately STEM careers. I also like to just make it clear that I am not the Burger King. I just think that's important to just get out of the way. Okay. Um, so today uh, I'm gonna talk about the basics of applying for your colleges, which is uh, how to figure out where to apply, what colleges look for, what the parts of the application are, uh, what you need to do to apply, uh, the timeline you should follow, and I'll give you some tools that you can use to stay organized, okay? Um, and then uh, I'll get to that later. Okay, uh, so where should you apply, right? Uh, you ultimately are looking for a list of about eight to 12 total schools, okay? You want a few reach schools, two or three, but mostly ones that are target and safety or likely, which means that the chances of you getting in are pretty good, right? Uh, so I'll help define this a little bit, okay? But you wanna think about what would be a good fit for you, right? Um, one of the things that a lot of people, uh, words that people throw around when they talk about colleges are good, not good, bad, things like this, not very complex, right? But if somebody says to you, oh, that's a really good school, I hear that's a good school. What does that mean, right? Um, it might mean uh, that it's a good academic fit for you, right? MIT, a lot of people would say good school, not good for everybody. I have no business going to MIT. It would be a miserable experience for me, right? But if you are, you know, in the upper echelon of math brains globally, it might be a great academic fit for you. What about the social fit, right? The size, uh, what kind of clubs are there? What does the, the racial, ethnic, uh, and geographic diversity look like? The gender diversity, what kinds of students go there? Financial fit, right? Uh, college appears to be uh, obscenely expensive these days. Uh, it doesn't necessarily always shake out that way for everybody, but it's important to keep this in mind, right? Above all, right, uh, to my comment about, M about MIT before, highly ranked does not mean that it's good. It means that it's highly ranked. Um, but it doesn't inherently mean that it is a good school. It is not good for everybody. It is good for certain kinds of people who are interested in doing certain kinds of things. Um, so it's important not to just think about college in terms of uh, what one of my friends recently described as highly rejective colleges, okay? These are the colleges that say no to way more people than they say yes to. We want what we can't have. And so when you see these schools saying no to absolutely everybody, if you actually get in, it seems like a big deal, right? Um, but unfortunately, the narrative these days about college and, and the options that are out there is dominated by these really world famous places, right? That um, we come to believe that there are only 20 colleges in America that actually matter. And the rest are like, you're settling for it. And I think that that's really unfortunate. The US News and World Report rankings uh, is, is a complete scam and a racket. And I'd be happy to talk to you in depth about that. That's a whole separate presentation though. So I'm gonna move along. So where should you start? Um, you know, you want to ask some questions for and about yourself, right? What do you like to learn or what would you like to learn? So it does, that doesn't necessarily mean major, right? I like to learn stuff about how humans interact with each other, right? Something like that could be anthropology, sociology, psychology, economics. That's the entire political science. That's the entire field of social science, right? So you don't necessarily have to know what you're gonna major in right now, um, or maybe even when you get to college. I mean, it's okay to be undecided, um, which is probably for you, if you're, if you're undecided, it doesn't mean you're trying to decide between something and nothing. You're trying to decide between a variety of things, or maybe you don't even know what it's called yet, right? Because there's so much stuff in college that you haven't had access to in high school, that when you get to college and you go, oh, linguistics, that's really cool. I never heard about that. Well, that's the whole point of college, 
really, right? It's to introduce you to things that you, you would never have the opportunity to, to come across on your own or that you haven't had the opportunity to do in high school because it's just, high school is not about learning linguistics, right? It's about, it's about the, the, the more fundamental basic stuff. How do you like to learn? Do you like to work in groups? Do you like to work by yourself? Um, do you like to do you know, project-based work? Do you like to write papers? You know, what, what kinds of things do you like to learn? So I think understanding that is, is also important. Who do you like to learn with, right? Or who would you like to learn with? A lot of people like to go to college because it is nothing like their hometown, right? Uh, I am gonna finally go to that place because like, that's where my people are, I think. Or um, uh, I am uh, tired of my, you know, particular kind of high school environment. I wanna go someplace that's very different from that. Or actually I'm really comfortable in my high school environment. I wanna to go to a place that feels like that. Right? These are important factors to think about. What parameters of your family set for you, right? Parents and guardians sometimes have some very particular thoughts about where you're gonna to apply to college. Right. You are not going to apply to college anywhere that is outside of a, you know, three hour car ride from Pittsburgh. You know, those things can have a, a limiting factor a little bit on your search, which is OK. You want to find limiting factors. That's the whole idea. Right. Uh, how have you done in school so far? You know, if you've just been cruising and it just seems easy, it seems like a complete breeze and uh you know, you can't wait to get to something more difficult, then maybe you want to aim high, right, in terms of aspirations. Um, if school has not been your most favorite thing, you know, maybe you don't want to pick an environment that is going to have really, really, really heavy academic expectations on you. But understanding kind of how you've done in school so far is going to help to give you a little bit of a sense of, of you know, this reach target and likely thing. Like I said, I'll get into that in a minute. But I like to start here. So there are three big questions to get your list smaller. Where in the world? Where in proximity to a city? Which also means what is a city to you? Because there are very different definitions of that depending on who you are and what your experience is like. You know, uh, if Pittsburgh is the sum total of your idea of what a city is, then you know uh, there's a lot of other options out there, right? Uh, bigger and smaller alike. And then how big a school? If you can answer these questions. Um, for yourself, there are only going to be a certain number of schools that, that fit these parameters, right? So for instance, uh, where in the world? Think about weather, right? I started off talking about Portland and being rainy. I don't want to, I was tired of this. I wanted to see what it was like to live in a place with like palm trees, right? So, um, so this is what, uh, this is something that, that matters to me and it might matter to you. It might not matter to you. But if it does, right, they can have the world's most fantastic biomedical engineering program, right? Uh, but if you have decided that you just absolutely hate the snow, you want nothing to do with it, um, then it doesn't matter how great the engineering program is if you're going to be just cold and miserable during a chunk of your, of your academic year, right? Family, again, do they want you to leave? Do you have family in other towns uh, or other places that might make your parents a little bit more comfortable with you going to college because there's a, a family network there? Travel time, right? How close or far do you need to be or want to be from home? And then just like, where would it be cool to live for four years? If you have the ability to be kind of mobile and to go anywhere, then this is a great, this is like the most fun part, right? Is to just like, look at the map. Right, so there's Pittsburgh. <clears throat> um, where sounds cool? Uh, is it Portland, Oregon? Look at it. Look at it, you guys. That's Mount Hood in the background. It's beautiful, isn't it? Isn't it glorious? That tall building all the way on the right. Uh, there's a law firm in there. I worked in the mail room in high school. Uh, or, you know, will you do what I did and head to, you know, SoCal, something like that? or Miami, not bad, right? Uh, or maybe it's the lovely Northern Shore, Chicago, Illinois, right? Maybe it's uh, Weber State University in Ogden, Utah. What? Well, I'll have you know, the greatest basketball player on planet Earth, yes, Damian Lillard, went to college at Weber State in Ogden, Utah. But look at that, look how beautiful that is, 
mountains. It's just glorious. Uh, maybe it's Yellow Springs, Ohio. What? Yellow Springs, Ohio is where Antioch College is, um, one of America's great experimental lefty colleges. Uh, but who would want to live in Yellow Springs, Ohio? I'll tell you who. Dave Chappelle. Dave Chappelle lives in Yellow Springs, Ohio. He goes to like city council meetings and stuff. Like he's a real dude that lives in Yellow Springs, Ohio. You could live there just like Dave Chappelle. Uh, or maybe it's the University of North Dakota in Grand Forks, North Dakota, right? That's an inspiring image, isn't it? My cousin's an airline pilot. He's an airline pilot because he went and did a special program at the University of North Dakota because they have a program there. The air, the thin, cold air up there is perfect for learning how to fly. Uh, or maybe it's New York, right? Where would you want to go? You can play around with it. So where in proximity to a city and what is a city to you, right? Is it epic scale with international airport, direct flights, some sort of thrilling social or, or industrial options by which I mean, um, hey, you wanna study film? New York, LA, Atlanta, Toronto, right? These are the, those kinds of places. Or is it, you know, something a little smaller, right? Uh, and then as far as the proximity to a city goes, you know, do you want to be right downtown? So in Boston, that's Boston University. Or do you want to be able to go to the city, but just not live right in the middle of it? So that'd be like Boston College. Or do you want to live in a college town where the entire game in town is the college? That's Ann Arbor, Michigan, right? Uh, or do you want to sort of observe the real world from a distance, right? Quite a ways away from civilization where, you know, for instance, Bard College in Annandale on Hudson, New York. Uh, not a lot going on in Annandale on Hudson, New York, right? But um, the proximity to the city is really going to impact what your social life is like. So if you're in a Bard College kind of a situation, your social life is by and large going to be what's going on on campus. Um, but if you are right downtown at Boston University, you know, your social life is going to be also dictated somewhat by what's going on in the city around it, right? Um, so again, how big a school? Epic scale, infinite opportunities. That's Penn State, right? That's gigantic. Infinite opportunities. For some people, that's like, it's just too much, though. It's too much infinity. Mid-sized is a very loose term. It ranges anywhere from like 5,000 to 15,000. So right in the middle is like Carnegie Mellon, for instance. This tends to be the sort of Goldilocks size of school for people. Not too big, not too small, but just right. But there aren't a ton of those, frankly, you know? Um, and so it's important to kind of know what you think. And then as far as small to tiny, so you got Swarthmore in Philly, right? With only about 16,000 total undergraduate students, or 1,600 rather, really, really, really small, okay? So here's what matters, right? So here's a tiny school in a big city. This is Occidental College in Los Angeles. There really aren't very many tiny schools inside big cities. This is one of few. So if you're in a tiny school in a big city like Occidental, you've got the campus community and what goes on there. And you've also got the city of Los Angeles, right? Tiny school, tiny town, here's Bard. Like that's what it looks like. Okay, you are, when you're at Bard, that's where you are. You are nowhere else, okay? Um, big school, big city, NYU, right? This is the only way, by the way, that you even know that anything is NYU is because they have a purple flag outside that says it's a NYU building. Otherwise, there is no campus, right? It's very seamless. It's very, like, seamlessly integrated into the city. Uh, or big school, college town, like Penn State, right? You can look around, you look around like outside the campus picture, there's not a lot, right? So that's the town. That's what's going on basically is the college, okay? So understanding those three things can be really important, okay? Another thing to do, this is something that, that, that is iterative. It takes time. And by the way, I wanna go back to this. So how do you know what you want in any of these things? Well, part of this like is easy to do nearby, wherever you live. You can go and visit colleges near to you to just know what it you don't have to be interested in any of these schools but you could go and visit them just to see what a giant college town feels like or what a really small liberal arts college feels like to kind of develop your type right uh, you don't have to go to uh, every college that you're going to apply to 
But if it's within driving distance, it's relatively easy to get to, you should probably go and visit, right, um, to check it out. So you want to sort of figure out what you want, right? Because we're going to talk in a couple of days about um, uh, a day after tomorrow about, about writing. Colleges, the, the number one uh, most common thing that colleges ask you to write about is why do you want to go here? And it is much, much easier to answer that question if you know what you want and that they have it, right? So you want to know what you want. So again, you know, the who, where, what, why, how kinds of questions are good ones to ask. But maybe these are, these are some examples that could be on your mind, right? They must have a computer science major with the ability to concentrate in artificial intelligence. Maybe you actually know that that's what you want, right? In which case, go for it. But you want to be as specific as you can, too. No more than 5,000 undergraduate students are the average class size of, of, of 20. So that's how do you like to learn. I like to learn in a small learning environment not a huge one, right? Uh, it has to be close to home, but you want to define how close home, how, how close close is, right? And that's the sort of family parameters question. It can't cost more than this much per year. It's got to have a, you know, big, big time football team or something like that. Um, so that's, again, who do you like to study with or study, right? Who do you want to be around when you're in a college environment? Maybe you're interested in uh, fraternities or sororities. Uh, and then you certainly want likely to admit me to be on your list. Uh, and uh, yeah, so those are just some examples of some things that can help you narrow down the list. So if you have a list like this of these seven things, plus you understand how big a school you want, its proximity to a city and where in the country it wants to be, your list automatically goes zoop down to a really tiny number. And then you can kind of uh, play with these parameters a little bit if they're too onerous, if your list is too small and see what you can give ground on to kind of open up some opportunities. But that's gonna really help narrow down your list just a ton, okay? Um, all right, so uh, where should you apply? Again, aim for a healthy combination of reach, target, and likely schools. You wanna diversify your risk. You do not want to only to schools that are impossible to get into because with no options. You do not want that. So how do you tell if a school is a reach target or a likely school? If you are below the average admitted student profile or it's a school with admit rate below 20%, it's considered a reach school. That could be, it could not be a reach for you at under 20%, okay? But you don't want unhappy surprises. You don't want to expect to get in some place and not have it happen. To reach schools, you should never expect that it's going to happen. I'm sorry if that sounds like very Debbie Downer-ish, but just you, you, you need to kind of protect your emotional and mental state through all of this as much as you possibly can. So if you place all of your emotional eggs into the baskets of extremely highly selective colleges um, and you don't get in and you're expecting it, uh, it's not a good feeling if it doesn't happen. So just assume eh, it might not happen. Be cool if it did, but it might not. And then, you know, really get hyped about your target and likely schools. Okay. So your uh, uh, target school is a school where you're right in the admitted student profile, right? Your GPA, your, your, your test scores, they all look like yeah, this is about where I'm at, right? There's more uh, complexity to this, and hopefully you've got some school counselors that can help you walk through it a little bit too, but generally speaking, this is the way it works. If you're above the admitted student profile, it's probably likely, okay? You do not want to treat your safety school like a safety school. Otherwise, it ceases to become a safety school, which means you want to make sure that you're engaged in the application process for a school on your likely list, just as engaged as you are uh, for a school that's a, a reach or a target, okay? So look, colleges generally do everything they can to look hard to get into. So you're gonna research their average GPA and it's gonna say 4.9 or something absurd like that, right? Um, so don't take yourself off the table to apply to a school just because it appears like it might look too hard to get into. Um, as long as your list is diverse, you're okay, all right? Oops. 
Okay, I did not want to do that. I want to come back here and do this. Okay. So, um, yes, calculate your GPA if you don't know it. It's easy to do. You probably can do it, no problem. Um, you want your test scores and, uh, you know, to be in the middle 50% range of admitted students. Now, I'll talk about scores in a minute. But if you choose to submit your test scores, uh, middle 50% is how they report it. So if they say that the admitted students here get between a 31 and a 33, the middle 50% get between a 31 and a 33 on their ACT score, that means that 25% of enrolling students got below that and 25% got above that, right? So if you have below a 31 and they say that the average is right there, and you have a 29, you could very well be in the 25% of admitted students, right? Um, but uh, that's, what they, that's what that means when they talk about a um, middle 50% range. Um, some of you may have some tools at school that can give you some data. Naviance, Score, Maya Learning are some popular ones, uh, but these are tools that will give you information about how students from your high school have, have fared in the admissions process at other colleges. Uh, so, you know, you may be looking at a school and seeing it as a, uh, a target, but then you log in here and you see that students with, a lot of students with stronger academic, academic profiles than yours didn't get in, it might not be a target, right? So this can be a useful tool to understand uh, depending on what you have at school. But again, you want to check this with your school college counselor. Reach target likely will depend on uh, on many factors, but this is this is kind of the best way to think about it right now. Okay. Um, as far as picking schools go, like I really like to think about this, right? I, um, that uh, this is a Abraham Maslow was a was a, a, a social scientist who developed this theory that. We all, we all need all of these things in order to be a complete human being. And we need them in this order, right? That before we can think about security and safety, we've got to think about food, water, warmth, and rest. Before we can think about having friends and how our relationships are, are, are doing, we have to make sure that we're, that we're safe, that we're not hungry, that we're right? not tired and warm. Each of these things has a corresponding factor when it comes to college. So all this stuff matters, you know, people kind of chuckle when it's like, well, make sure you try the food on campus, you know, but if the food sucks and you're, or you're, you know, there's no healthy option, or if you're like gluten-free and they don't have any of that, or if you're kosher or um, halal or, or whatever, and they don't have those options, like it doesn't matter anything else up the pyramid, you're just going to be miserable. So it does matter um, in many cases, the prestige of the school to families, right, to students, esteem needs. You have to feel good about your, about where you are, about who you're with and about what you're doing. Um, so all of these things really uh, factor into it. You, you, you wanna make sure that you're thinking about uh, this kind of stuff as you're pulling your list together. Of course, I'll share this with you, okay? Um, test optional colleges. So yes, last year, absolutely everybody on planet Earth went test optional. This year, 95% of those still are, okay? If you wanna know who they are, come here. But otherwise, generally speaking, most colleges are gonna make it optional for you to submit test scores. So now, when should and when shouldn't you submit your test scores? Sometimes it makes sense to submit them. Um, so you should submit your test scores uh, if, you are, if you have them, right? If you've been able to actually sit for an exam and receive scores. If you have them and they are within or above the college's middle 50% range, right? So I was talking about the, that school with a 31 to 33 ACT. If you have a 31 or higher, probably a good idea to submit your scores. But when you should maybe not submit them if you don't have them because you tests kept getting canceled or whatever, right?
Uh, uh, hello? I think Davin might be frozen for a minute. Let's give him a, a second to try to get back to us. I think he's back. Oh my God. That was touch and go. That was touch and go. <laughs> uh, after an entire year of this, right? <laughs> it never ends. Plus, you would think. Okay. So uh, feel free to ask me questions about the, the test optional stuff, but it really is optional. You do not have to submit your scores. Um, but if you choose to submit your scores, they should be, they should be good ones, right? Where should you apply? So there are some tools to aid in your college search here. Okay. Um, college board website is really good. You can plug in a lot of different parameters and then it spits out a list of, of potential colleges. If you really want to dig into the, the numbers, uh, you can go to collegedata.com, virtual campus tours. If you want to know where colleges are actually doing in-person campus tours, here's a, a, a website that I've linked to that I'll share with you so you can look and see if they're actually offering in-person tours and information sessions. Anywhere you can go physically, you, you should try. It's, it's good for a million reasons. But if you can't, if you just can't, um, then you can't. But if you can, you should try. College website and information sessions are very good, right? Register for and attend virtual information sessions. So if you register for it, and then if you attend, they tend to take attendance and, and they wanna see if you actually show up. So you need to go, you need to actually go. Uh, and if you can't do an in-person visit anywhere, absolutely everybody can do a virtual one. You do not wanna be the person that didn't visit or do a virtual information session, right? Do as many of these as you can for the schools that you're interested in and that are pertinent, right? Don't do them just to do them, but do them because it's full of valuable information, okay? Um, so when should you apply? Early decision is a binding arrangement. I'm sure you've heard about this. This means that you apply, uh, and if you get in under the terms of this agreement, you must enroll, you must not apply anywhere else, you must withdraw applications that are pending at any other schools. So this is it. You apply early decision. If it's the one place you will go, no questions asked. It is complicated though. We'll talk about that. There is early action, which is you apply early, you hear back early, that's it. It's not binding. You can apply to both, right? You can apply to early action schools and one early decision school. But if you get into your early, act, early decision school, you have to withdraw your applications from the early decision school or early action schools, right? Sorry. Um, regular decision, this is the last deadline by which you can apply. This is usually January, okay? Rolling decision, apply whenever, and then you hear back usually in a space of a couple of weeks. University of Pittsburgh, um, you can submit your application in August and hear back before, you know, roughly before, maybe right after school starts, hear back by Labor Day. And then you've already got an option in your back pocket. If you really, really wanna to go to the University of Pittsburgh, then this whole process can be over nice and early for you, right? If you can apply, uh, apply by this rolling deadline and then get your, get your information back. There are other random things, single choice early action, restrictive single choice early action, places like Stanford and uh, Notre Dame, like this is how they do it, right? This is it. Yes, you can apply early action to our school, however, uh, you cannot apply early action to any other school anywhere else. They have ways of figuring out if you have, you know, it sounds like a little bit of a cartel sort of action for me, but like the, generally speaking, um, those are very, very rare. The last one, the other random things. Okay. But what, as far as you're concerned, you should always apply by the earliest non-binding deadline. Okay. If a school offers early action, you should apply early action. Here's why. Number one, you just look like you kind of have your stuff together, right? You pulled it together, you got it in by November 1st. That's typically when early action and early decision applications are due. That's good. You know, you've demonstrated the initiative to get your application complete and get it in. But more importantly, uh, this is a human process. People like me read applications, right? 
I would read probably a thousand applications a year. I was much, much more excited about doing it at the beginning of the process than I was at the end, right? So uh, we want you to, uh, you know, appeal to the human element in this process. So apply early um, because the chances are you're gonna get the admissions reader at their best. That's just true. Um, so you wanna define a financial fit too, okay? Um, I think you should, you know, make sure that you've, got a con you've had a conversation as a family about affordability and keep all four years in mind. You don't really wanna have this conversation next April when you're trying to decide where you're gonna go. And um, all of a sudden you learn from your parents that a school that's gonna give you only this amount of financial aid is now no, no, no longer possible, right? Um, the schools that are the hardest to get into, the most selective, uh, therefore the wealthiest, those kinds of places tend to have the best financial aid, um, which is a double-edged sword. Um, but you also want to make sure, you know, give yourself an in-state option, you know, wherever you live, you know, you want to apply at least to Penn State if you're in Pennsylvania or University of Pittsburgh. Um, but, you know, you don't have to, uh, so that you've at least got that option uh, to consider. Use online resources like net price calculators to help. So if you just Google the name of the school and a net price calculator, then you'll, you'll find them. And a net price calculator basically gives you a very rough estimate of what you can expect to receive and need-based financial aid from a school. So you plug in some information from your tax returns, it's anonymous, um, and they can basically give you then generate a, 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 an example of here's more or less how much need-based financial aid we'd get from you, or uh, we would give you. It's not liable to take scholarships into account. Um, scholarships is another ball of wax I can talk to you about too. Um, if you apply to schools that are more likely to accept you, then they're more likely to want to enroll you and to entice you to enroll with scholarships, okay? This is also when it can help to submit scores that, that, that help the school's average. It's stupid, it's not correct, it's inequitable. Um, it's probably racist too, at worst, uh, to continue to incentivize the use of standardized test scores as far as I'm concerned. Um, but they will incentivize, you know, you coming to their campus with merit scholarship money uh, if you have scores that, that look good to them. That is not the case at the most highly coveted schools at the top of the food chain. They know how special they are. They do not have to entice you with anything, okay? Um, but a lot of these schools are considered no loan schools where if your family is at a certain income threshold, then you will not have to pay anything. Uh, that threshold is different from school to school, but um, worth looking at. Um, so you wanna go to schools that are, that are gonna meet full demonstrated need. So typically if you apply to a public school out of state, they are not gonna help you with anything, really, generally speaking. Places like the University of Alabama, if you have a certain GPA and test score profile, they do automatically guarantee a certain amount of money to you. There aren't a lot of those kinds of places though. They wanna charge the max to out-of-staters because they sort of subsidize the cost of attendance that they charge at a much lower rate to people that are in-state. Private schools out of state are the ones that are going to meet full demonstrated need and in state, I should say. Private schools are the ones that are more like, likely to do this and then public schools in state, okay? Um, consider costs like transportation between home and campus, right? Because it can be one thing to look at uh, the cost of attendance, but uh, you know, tuition, books, stuff like that. But if you have an idea that you're going to go home for every little thing, every three-day weekend, right, all of that stuff, and it's the price of a, you know, a plane ticket, a round-trip plane ticket, well, that could, that could really add up, right? So there are some, some little things here that, that you do want to kind of factor into it all. Um, if you have financial need, early decision can be complicated, right? Because not only do you have to accept their offer of admission, you also have to accept it under the terms of whatever amount of money they do or don't give you. So early decision can help your chances because they know that they've got you if you're coming, 
and they like that, the enrollment managers. Um, but they may not give you a lot of money. And if you are on the hook to enroll and the price tag is too steep, that is a very complicated place to be. And you do not want to be there. So if you're going to apply early decisions someplace, you've really, really, really got to know that it's going to work out for you financially. Okay. Um, so here are the things that colleges look for. We have 15 minutes. Is that right, Dave? We're done at noon. Yeah, but we have some extra time, Devin. If you oh, need, hot damn. You time. Yeah, we, we have interpreters all the way to one. So. Oh, wow. Yep. Okay, great. Well, uh, we'll make this. We have some we'll, flexibility. We'll, we'll stretch it out then, okay, and make sure that there's time for, for Q&A. So please um, collect some questions, and we'll, we'll have a discussion at the end. So uh, grades in your transcript. This is number one. Every single college admissions counselor that you talk to, when you ask them what's the most important thing, it's this. Uh, GPA is like, imagine an iceberg, right? GPA is the very tip of it. But all of the work that you've done, you know, your entire academic history is everything under the surface of that tip of the iceberg, right? It is the, the result of individual assignments over time and in individual classes that ultimately resulted in a grade and then a collection of all of those grades. And it all feeds into this one big number that is very, very problematic. So colleges don't just look at GPA, even though they do report it. What they look at is your actual report card and they see how things have gone from ninth grade all the way through. They want to see what were the opportunities that were available to you in your high school in terms of challenging yourself. So, you know, do you have AP, IB, honors kinds of courses? And, and to what extent did you take advantage of those? You know, you're not supposed to necessarily have 9 million AP classes, okay? Um, you want to challenge yourself within the limits of your ability to, to meet those challenges, okay? Um, they also want to see how you did, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th, right? Your high school career has been significantly uh, impacted, right? Uh, given the way last year and the end of the year before that looked. So they're going to probably understand if there's a little bit of a change in grades. Maybe they're gonna be uh, impressed if there isn't and if the grades continue to stay nice and strong. But generally speaking, you know, those of you who are approaching 12th grade remember how different a person you were in ninth grade. There's a lot of change that happens and they wanna account for that and understand it. They wanna see generally that your grade trend has been either nice and high throughout or improving. Typically you do not want your grades to dip in the 11th grade year, although those of you who were 11th graders, your, your grade may have dipped, there's definitely a chance that, you know, the conditions under which you were learning had a uh, influence that, right, in a, in a way that, that is understandable. But generally, they want to understand the trend of, over time, okay? Uh, again, test scores. Uh, they'll look at them if you send them. But if you don't send them, they won't. It's really that easy. Okay. Um, and then typically this means you do need to send the score. Some places they'll let you self-report your, your score so that you don't have to spend money on sending it because it costs like 14 bucks per school to send your scores. Um, but you, you know, whether it's the College Board or the ACT, you uh, will need to actually send an official score report at some point. So we'll talk more about the uh, about this uh, day after tomorrow, but writing is a, is a huge part of what they look at. So you've got your personal statement, which is the college essay. You've also got supplemental essays, right, that I was alluding to before. Why do you want to go here? Tell us more about what you want to study. Elaborate on an extracurricular activity of yours. Uh, all kinds of different things that they may ask. Uh, and in many cases, these can be more important than the personal statement. There is an additional information section. If there's something that you need to tell us that just hasn't been able to find its way into any other part of the application, then here's, here's 650 words for you to, to tell us about that. 
Um, extracurricular activities, this is another form of writing in my opinion. But in terms of the common application, which is the application that you'll use to apply to the majority of the schools that you apply to, you have 10 places to add extracurricular activities and describe them in 150 characters, not words, but characters. So it's a really, really restrictive word limit. You know, some of you, you know, like you live, eat, breathe, debate, you know, and you've been doing that for all high school, maybe even sooner. How the heck are you supposed to kind of pack all of what that means to you into a 150 character description, right? It's really a challenge, but it's doable. Everything outside the classroom counts as extracurricular, okay? Extracurricular means outside the normal course of study. So it can be hobbies, it can be part-time job, it can be, you know, caring for siblings or, or parents or, uh, you know, anything that you do. It doesn't just mean clubs, uh, but sports, hobbies, jobs, anything counts, okay? Letters of recommendation. Your school counselor will have to submit one for you. And then two teachers is the standard, but sometimes they have some room for, for, for other recommenders. You know, if there are people in this program, for instance, that you really uh, connected with that you might wanna ask for a letter, you can do that. But you'll wanna check with the individual colleges to see uh, how friendly they are towards taking more than the, more than the, than the uh, what they've recommended right, which is usually a school counselor and two teachers. Uh, there is potentially some other stuff that they look at, right? So if you're applying as an art student or something, uh, there may be portfolio requirements. They wanna look at some stuff. They wanna look at the movies you've made or the music you've made or the art you've made. Uh, but then there's also interviews and in this concept of demonstrated interest. So some colleges do admissions interviews, not all of them. If any of this stuff, with the exception of test scores, Truly, test scores are truly optional. But otherwise, if they have like an optional essay or an optional interview, you should just consider that required because you don't want to leave any stone unturned, right? You want to, it is a competitive process and you want to kind of compete to the uh, maximum of your ability to do so. You get a lot of points for sitting down and talking to a total stranger about your life hope, goals, dreams, aspirations in an interview. It's really entirely to your benefit to do that. So demonstrated interest means um, a lot of these colleges, they do not want to offer admission to even one more student than they actually have to. So they are trying to enroll let's say exactly 1,250 freshman students. That means that they have to figure out how the heck among all of the students in their applicant pool, which are the 1,250 students that are gonna come? And how many students do I actually have to offer admission to in order to yield those 1,250, right? Some schools, uh, the highest sort of yield rate in the country is in like the 85%, but the, the, the average is more like 30, right? Um, so help me do the math. So for every 10 students, they have to enroll, they have to accept, uh, you know, what, seven to enroll three, is that right? I don't know. But yeah, something like that. <laughs> Spanish, guys. Okay. Math. But generally speaking, the more engaged you are in their process, the more that you look like you are interested, that you demonstrate your interest in the school, the more likely they are to think this kid's actually interested. So that if everything looks good in the application and then we offer admission to the student, they might actually come. You want them to think that you would actually go to their school. This is kind of complicated, you know, because you want to genuinely want to go to all of the schools that you apply to. But invariably, there are schools on your list that you want to go to more than others, you know. Uh, and if you treat a likely school like a likely school, which is to say, hey, they offer interviews, but you just didn't take the time to do it because you're not really that interested. Well, maybe they'll say, oh, I see. We are a safety school for you. 
we are not going to waste an offer of admission on you because you're not taking this seriously. So if you want your safety schools to stay safety schools, you have to treat them exactly as you would at your first choice school. Okay. Uh, timeline. On August 1st, the common application opens. And I think I looked like Pittsburgh, it looks like the school starts August 26th. Um, the common application is available now. You can create an account right now and go in and, and, and start to fill some things out. But on August 1st, it resets for the 21-22 academic year. So anything that you see in the common application right now that's specific to colleges is there for the students that graduated from high school this year. So for instance, the supplemental essay prompts that you might see in there might not be the same ones that are there on August 1st. It gives colleges the opportunity to change anything that they want about their application by August 1st, okay? So um, between you know, August 26th and then thousands of tiers later, or more like, more like nine weeks, then uh, the first round of applications are due, November 1st. That's 118 days from right now. <laughs> Sorry if that sounds like not a lot of time, but um, it goes incredibly quickly between now and then. Again, if you're applying by the earliest non-binding deadline that you should at all the schools on your list, then you're gonna have some schools for November 1st. Um, in which case, you know, we should start to pull some things together, right? Because then what? Thanksgiving, Christmas break, and then January is the final application deadlines. All this stuff creeps up really, really quickly. Um, and, you know, we go back to what do colleges look for and think about the fact that your transcript is really, really important. And that this last year was really weird and this next year might actually be more like normal. Um, you don't want to be working on all of this college stuff while school is going on any more than you have to you really wanna to try to kind of clear the decks of all this college stuff as much as you can so that you have the freedom to um, focus on your, your schoolwork and continue to get the best grades that you've ever gotten. The 11th grade year is really important because it's the last complete year that they look at um, by the time you apply. But they're going to continue to ask your school to send them updates. You know, the first quarter, certainly this, the, the, the end of the first semester and so on. So you want your grades to continue to be really, really good. The one way to guarantee that this process is as stressful as this can possibly be is that if you put all of this off until after school starts, you do not want to do that. Okay, so start to organize things. Um, Identify a core group of schools that you want to apply to. That doesn't mean your list needs to be totally, totally final. It will continue to shift as you uh, get closer to things, uh, closer to deadlines, and you start to do more research, start looking into stuff. So, but if you've got, you know, four or five schools that you know that you want to apply to, then, you know, start to understand the deadlines and what the admissions process is at each of these schools. Organize the supplemental essays for the schools on your list. So while many of them may not be fully available until August 1st, a lot of them, it's easy to find them out already because the school has said, we're not gonna change them. It's the same as last year, or uh, we have changed them and here they are. You're gonna be able to find that on their, on their website. Um, so you wanna um, create a document with all of your schools on it, the deadlines that you're applying to and plug the uh, supplemental essays into that document and um, begin to draft some responses. If you've got drafts of your essay, your personal statement and the supplemental essays that you can you know, show your school counselor or, or other trusted adult before school starts or right around the time school starts then you're, you're doing great, okay? But generally speaking, the truly difficult work of applying or the time consuming work of applying to college is all about writing. And like I said, we'll talk more about this on Thursday. Uh, as far as tools go, I'm gonna give you guys something like this. This is what I use, okay? Um, that uh, helps students a great deal, uh, just kind of organize their, their uh, 
college research and stuff. So let me copy this and I will put it uh, into the into the chat and then you guys can just make a copy for yourself and do whatever you want. Oh man, I just finally saw the Dame time. Yes, thank you. It's always Dame time. Until and except he decides that he's going to go someplace else, but I'm not entertaining that thought. Uh, so here's some general stuff that you may want to keep track of, right? Um, where is it? What's the location like, right? How big is it, right? These are the first three things that I talked about, right? To help narrow the list down. Majors of interest. You know, you might put business, but the school calls it financial economics, right? So you wanna really know specifically what the name of the program is that you're applying to. Um, and you can put several of them in here. You know, what are their, what are their admitted stat, student stats look like? Um, what's their need-based financial aid situation look like? And then you can start to take some, some qualitative notes, you know, notes on the academic program. How do you go about choosing a major? Is it easy to get to know teachers? What's the curriculum like? Are they gonna make me take a ton of things that I don't wanna take or is it super flexible and I get to pick all kinds of things? If you hate this school, why? Understanding why you do not want to apply to a school is just as, is just as helpful in figuring out why you do want to apply to schools. Um, so you wanna to begin to, to define those, those parameters for yourself. And then if you wanna apply, Great, right? And then just keep, keep track of that. If you like this school, what are two or three specific things that you like about it? Specific things. If you take these notes right now as you're doing this research, then uh, you don't have to go back and as you're sitting there writing that supplemental essay asking why you want to go here and, and sit there and think to yourself, why do I want to go here again? This happens time and time and time again. No details too small. You know, uh, I heard that they do uh uh you know every thursday is is taco thursday because lebron james already trademarked taco tuesday so you know and i just like tacos that's fine that means you're paying attention if you put something in there like that and then you want to keep track of are you signed up to receive emails from them okay uh so university of oregon uh contact admissions, for instance, contact us, uh, and then sign up to join our mailing list right there, okay? Every, they, they, try, they should make it as easy as possible to get your information. So you're gonna see form after form that looks just like this. But then you can say, yes, I have, I'm getting emails from them. Okay, so you've got your, your general list of schools here, you've got research tools here, okay? Some of the stuff that I mentioned in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the presentation. But first and foremost, your super specific priorities. What do you want? And I made a little drop down menu here. You know, do you want a priority? Maybe you want a priority related to the academics of it or the geography of it or the outcomes like, you know, good placement into the aerospace industry, right? Reputational means like, it's gotta be fancy. People's jaws have to drop when I say the name of it, right? Uh, the more specific you can be with your list of priorities, the easier it is for you to then tell them why they're a fit. Because you say, here are the things I want and here are the things you have. So that's, that's why I'm applying. Again, this is all in service to finishing the application strongly. Ultimately, this list of schools here, they will need to go into one of two locations eventually. They will either need to go on the quote unquote final list. Nothing is final until you press submit. But the quote unquote final list. And then there are some things on here that you're keeping track of that you're not necessarily doing research for, you know, in the big list. Like, uh, is it a reach target or likely for me? How many essays am I gonna to have to write? What's the name of my admissions representative for my high school at this college? So U of Oregon, for instance, 
you can see here, right in that same place where I see contact, find your counselor, your zip code. I live in the BX. So let's see, I think it's Joelle. Yep, there she is. So now if I have any questions about my application to the University of Oregon, I'm gonna give Joelle a ring or shoot her a note. You wanna collect all of that information here too. All right. Uh, are you applying test optional? It'll depend on the school maybe, right? So if you are applying test optional, then this one is gonna be blank. But if you are not, then this one is gonna be check mark once you send those scores, right? And then there are these three. So let's say you're applying early action, University of Oregon. Their deadline, probably November 1st, right? Uh, but when's your deadline? When do you wanna have this done by? Do you wanna go and hang out and have fun at Halloween? Or do you wanna to continue to be working on this stuff during Halloween? So maybe your deadline is more like October 15th. Right? You know, and then you can just kind of keep track of like why you're applying to this place. And then again, interviews offered. Do they do them? A lot don't, but if they do, you should do it. In which case, go ahead and sign up. And then here's the information. Interview, date, time, uh, uh, let's see, date, time, location. Might be Zoom, might be in person, right? And then if you don't like a school, don't remove it altogether, but throw it over here so that you can keep track of the schools that you considered but aren't going to apply to and maybe why. Okay. Um, so that will help you stay organized. Uh, are there at this point any questions that I can answer for folks? Because we've gone through a ton of things. It's now a little past 12. Um, what's on your mind? Anything you want any additional information about? This is in no way comprehensive. You know, there's uh, so much to think about, so much to consider still uh, when it comes to applying to college, but this is, the, this is the nuts and bolts. Any questions, feel free to type them in chat, raise your hand, unmute any of the above. I forgot uh, to show you this giant thing that's sitting right here next to me. Um, this is a really, really good tool. Um, it's about 20 bucks on Amazon. And I think when you're doing college research and you want to figure something out about a school, you can just read an entry in here, that like maybe three pages. And it gives a really, really good overview and description of the place. Uh, if you don't have 20 bucks, Mr. Boone definitely does. <laughs> so he'll help you. Absolutely. He'll help you buy it. Um, but generally this is, if you're going to buy a book, if you're going to have something to help you, like this is, this is a really, really good thing. Okay. It doesn't have every college, but it's got most of the ones that students tend to apply to. Uh, if we're not sure what size of college we'd like, how do we figure that out? Um, this is a little bit like dating, right? Uh, you know, you, you sort of figure out your type after a while um or maybe you already know but otherwise if you don't you got to kind of check it out you got to play the field a little bit right so you got to go like again you don't have to go to colleges that you know for a fact you want to apply to but rather you can go to colleges that represent certain factors or 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 parameters right you don't want to go to swarthmore but you want to see what a little teeny tiny liberal arts college looks like go see what it looks like um, you don't want to go to Rutgers, but you want to see what a really big college campus looks like. Go check it out, right? And then little by little, you, 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 you can have a, 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 you can start to develop your sense of, of what feels good to you. Um, you know, reading this kind of thing can be helpful too, because for some people, 5,000 is huge. For some people, 5,000 is small. But um, hearing what the students have to say about it is really important. Um, so if you do tours, 
ask the tour guide, you know, does this place ever feel too big or too small? What do you do to combat that? Um, students that you know, friends that are in college that have already had some experiences on campus, they are an outstanding resource to help you uh, understand more about what the, uh, what the experience is like. It's really difficult, right? You guys have to, you can't really test drive a college experience um, the same way you can, you know, other things. Like I, if I'm gonna buy a house, I can do a walkthrough and I can get a pretty good idea of what this big giant investment I'm about to make is gonna get me, right? College is a lot very, very different. And so the best thing that you can do as far as college goes is to hear from people that are already having that experience. So as much as you can talk to students who are already in college, uh, that's gonna be the best source of information uh, as to what the experience is gonna be like. Uh, I see that Maria has her hand up. Go ahead, Maria. Yes, so in terms of test optional schools, yeah. deciding on test optional, um, what role did, would you say that plays in how many schools you apply to? And would you say to limit how many schools you apply test options? So do you mean, um, can, uh, can you say more about the first part of that? Like how, how it might inf impact the, the number of schools that you're applying to? Yeah, so I'm just like wondering, would you say to limit how many schools you apply to test optional? Or no, I, I, it's more, it's, it's more about, you know, you can apply to as many, I mean, the common application cuts you off at 20. You can't apply to more than 20 colleges using the common application. Okay. So let's say you want to apply to 20 colleges. Well, the amount of work that it's going to take to apply to those 20 colleges depends on which, what those 20 colleges are. Right. Um, test optional doesn't necessarily need to be any kind of limiting factor, uh, except if your list is, you know, full of schools that, uh, I, I can't really think of a reason why it might be a limiting factor at all. You know, I mean, I think that if, if you like, I, do you have any idea how jealous I am of your generation to just completely skip the SAT altogether? just not even have to take it. I cried when I opened my scores up. I was like, that's it. It's, it's prison. It's prison for me with these scores, you know? And it wasn't, but I would have loved to just not even have to go through that at all. You really don't have to. Um, but if you want to potentially positively impact your chances at some highly selective places by taking the test and getting a score that is at or above their average, maybe that's a route you want to go. But otherwise, it, I don't see why it would place a limit on the number of schools that you apply to. The only thing that really should place a limit on the number of schools you apply to is the amount of work involved. So for instance, the University of California system of colleges, so this is UCLA and Berkeley and UC San Diego, UC Santa Barbara, places like that. It's a separate application, so it's not the common application. That's a little bit more work. However, it's, you, you can apply to four schools with one application. So you pick four schools within the system. You don't have, it's not like applying to four schools, it's more like applying to one that way. But applying to some schools that are very, very highly selective and snobby and crazy like Yale and Stanford, make it really, really hard to apply by making you write and write and write and write. Um, and so if your list is full of schools that are gonna require 10 additional pieces of supplemental writing, do you really feel like doing, you know, a hundred pieces of unique writing to apply to college? I mean, that's overboard, but like, it's not uncommon for students to have lists that re require them to write 35 different little supplemental essays, right? So this is why you want to kind of understand the total amount of work that goes into applying, and that's going to place some limits on your list. Once you see, you may have a school on your list, and then you sit down to write, and you see what all is involved and what they're asking. You're like, oh man, maybe I don't like the school that much, you know, to invest the time. So um, to answer your question, 
the test optional piece doesn't have to limit the number of schools that you apply to at all. Um, rather, you want to apply to the right amount of schools that you can make sure that you're dedicating the, your full time and attention to. You don't want to spread yourself too thin, right? Uh, let's see what's up in the chat over here. Uh, what, what, yeah, great. What, do you have any recommendations, uh, differentiations for student athletes? Yeah, that's a whole other big, big thing too. So, um, if you're, it depends on the division on the NCAA, right? If you're applying to a division one school, these are the very, very, you know, this is like, these are the ones where you're, they, they pay you to go, right? They you get a scholarship to go there. Um, chances are, if you're actually competitive for that, you already know the answer to that question. But if you're not trying to play division one level, um, like division three is probably the next most popular for some reason. I don't know why it skips over two. Um, but you do not get an academic scholarship at a division three institution. Um, the coaches do, however, very much want you to play for their team. So if you're being recruited at a division three school, they may be able to place a little bit of a thumb on the scale in your favor for admission. So it can help your chances at a division three school if the coach wants you to play on their team. In many cases, however, they're also gonna ask you to apply early decision because they want that spot on their roster filled. You know, so if you're a power forward and they see you as their you know, next great power forward, they want you to apply early decision. If you're not gonna apply early decision, they're gonna to go to the next person on their list. And maybe they are interested in applying early decision. And then there goes your roster spot. So it can be complicated. Um, but either way, if you're interested in, in, in playing sports in college and playing at the NCAA level, uh, your best thing to do is to reach out to the coaches individually. Um, you know, so I used to work with the University of Rochester, Division Three. You want to play soccer, call a coach. Tell them, hi, I'm interested in playing soccer. And that will start the process. Okay. Um, there's more there, but I hope that's helpful. Generally speaking, um, you, the coaches are, sep are separate and the athletic process is separate, but it is involved in the admissions process. The coaches don't make admissions decisions. That's important to know, right? They might say, you got a shot. You're my, you're my person. You're coming. You're going to be the one, but they're not the one making the decision. The admissions office is making the decision, right? Um, okay, what sort of questions would it be best to contact admissions officers about? It's a great question. Anything that you want to know the answer to? I'm sorry, it's a stupid answer. <laughs> but, you know, uh, what do you, what information would you like about a school that you can't seem to find anywhere else? You know, um, you don't want to ask questions just to ask a question because somebody said you should contact them and ask them questions. Really ask them what they're, you know, uh, ask them anything that's on your mind. Who's a good fit for your college? You know, what are you guys looking for? Uh, and then see what they have to say. They might be able to give you some helpful hints to encourage your uh, activity in their application a certain way. But, um, you know, the, the most important questions to ask are, are, are genuine ones authentic questions that you really want to know the answer to. Um, for the acceptance process, I'm always confused on how they offer funding. You are not alone, Denise. Uh, would the amount being offered come in the letter of acceptance or would you need to calculate it based on your FAFSA with your counselor? Yeah. So typically speaking, the way that this works is the colleges have a list of students that they know that they're going to send an admit letter to. Once that list is done, they share that list with the financial aid office. And then the financial aid office can get to work producing financial aid packages for those students, as long as the financial aid documents have been submitted to the college. So this is the FAFSA, but it's also this really, really annoying long form that most of the private schools also require. And that is called the CSS profile. So in addition to the FAFSA, you may also need to submit a CSS profile. It goes into much greater depth 
in terms of understanding your family's financial condition. So typically speaking, the actual financial aid offer will not arrive until after you have been admitted. It takes them a little bit of time to package and process that information, right? That said, the net price calculators that I mentioned before can give you a hint. They are mandated by federal law to have net price calculators, but they are not mandated to be of any particular quality. So you might see some variety uh, in the usefulness of those tools, but Generally speaking, um, net price calculators can be helpful. One of the other things that I uh, really like to do, so I mentioned this website, okay? Uh, you wanna create a, uh, an account, it's free, but otherwise they'll just hit you with pop-up ads nonstop. So, if you want to really kind of get into the weeds and understand the reality of what the finances look like at a school. So I like to use this one as an example, New York University. Okay. Um, is New York University going to give me any money, right? If I get in, that's the question. How much of this eye poppingly insane <laughs> number uh, are they going to actually charge me? So here's an interesting way to kind of understand that. So I'm at the college, I'm in the financials tab. I'm, 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 I'm now already just, I'm breathing into a paper bag to try to calm down because I just saw the cost of attendance. Uh, and I'm scrolling down to this part, profile of latest year financial aid. So of all of the, this is the number of freshmen that actually applied for financial aid, 57%. So that means that uh, the rest, 43% or whoever, right? Totally cool with this figure, <laughs> right? Like, so that tells me, okay, a lot of really, really rich people go to NYU. Um, now of those that applied, 25% of those Thanks for applying, but no, you, you, you will be getting charged the full amount. However, this 73.5% do have some financial need. Almost all of them did receive financial aid, but only 12.5% of them actually got their need fully met. The average percent of need met is 71%. Okay, so the question is, Somebody's probably can do this quicker. So that's a discount of fifty-four thousand six hundred dollars. Which still leaves you on the hook for twenty-two thousand dollars a year. Which means that that's uh, uh, eighty-eight thousand dollars to go to NYU for four years, right? So the average award though, more like 41,000. That's like a little more than half of that, okay? Now that's need-based aid. Merit-based, those are scholarships. Of those that applied for financial aid, only 138 of them got a merit-based scholarship. If you didn't apply for financial aid or, or rather you didn't qualify for need-based aid, only 4.4% of freshmen had no financial need and they got some money, but the average amount was 4,860, okay? I still owe NYU money so I can make fun of them. Uh, but generally speaking, right? So that's the last year. And then if you want to know like what it looks like for all undergraduates, this is what it looks like. So let's find, let's find another example um, to show you what, what it might look like elsewhere. So one of the other 
large, largest private research universities in the country. On the other side of the country, okay, USC, same, even more eye popping, okay? But let's look at the numbers. Uh, more applied, more actually were found to have need. 100% of those that had need had it fully met, right? And the average award was higher. The average award for merit-based scholarship for students that didn't qualify, way higher, right? So you can learn a lot of different things from looking at a, at a tool like that, okay? Uh, but otherwise, yeah, make sure that you're spending time talking to your counselor about, um, uh, about how this works because they have years of experience in understanding how certain students have, uh, have fared in the financial aid process at certain schools. Um, so there is a question about when should you start filling out the FAFSA and how do you go about doing that? I believe the FAFSA filing date, uh, let's see here. Yeah, you can supply, you know, you can, the, the, the deadline is, every school is gonna have a little bit of a different deadline, right? So if you're gonna apply by November 1st and you're hoping to hear back from those colleges with a, if they say yes to you, then you want your financial aid information to be in not much later than your application information. Each school is gonna have a little bit of a different deadline for financial aid, um, but typically it's, it's a little bit behind the application for admission process. Uh, but generally speaking, I believe uh, you know, the, the, the form for the year comes out in like October or something like that. And then you want to start to um, to do that, you know, if possible. And this is not everybody's. This is not possible for everybody. Um, you know, I, I struggle to encourage students to tackle the financial aid part. Sometimes you have to, but in many cases, this is better left to the parents. But many parents can't do it, right, uh, for one reason or another, and it is kind of on you. In which case, you do want to rely on the support that you have at school or other organizations as best you can to help make sense of it because it's really complicated, um, I'm sorry to say. Uh, there's a question here, just to clarify, supplemental essays are in addition to the common app, correct? That is correct. So the common application is the application that goes to every single school, but every single school is also gonna have their own supplemental application saying, yes, we know that you're applying to college, but why are you interested in us. And that is the supplemental uh, application. Uh, in addition to submitting the essay, the supplemental essays, you'll also indicate, you know, what it is you plan on studying there. Um, you know, the application plan that you're applying by. So there's some, a lot of information that's specific to that school, uh, which is why they create that. What else? What else? What else? 1230. Is it also supposed to be uh, unbearably hot today in Pittsburgh? I believe so. Sweet. Okay. I'll, I hope you're all <laughs> budding climate scientists. <laughs> Any other last questions for Devin? Great. Well, we're going to talk more on Thursday specifically about writing because it's a big part of the process. Um, a lot of the stuff that I've been telling you today is going to come back around and, and maybe sound familiar, but we'll we'll dig into that more on Thursday. And then, of course, um, you know, you'll have the ability to contact me later down the road if you have questions or anything. That help with. I'll download the Discord thing too and remember what that's like. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thanks, Devin. Really appreciate Thank you. it. Right yeah. on. Okay, and I'll see you guys on Thursday. Absolutely. Cheers. Bye-bye. Take care.